Hello, I'm Dan Pfeiffer, and today we're going to be looking at several types of circuits, and this segment will be divided into two parts. The first part, we're going to talk conceptually about uh, what makes an electrical circuit and uh, what types of circuits and components go into them. And then in part two, we're going to do a little bit of quantitative analysis for what are called series, parallel, and then both series and parallel combination circuits. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. There are three things that make up a circuit. You require one, a power supply, two, a load, which can be anything from a light bulb to a fan, a motor, something that, uh, as my students like to put it, is the energy taker, right? And three, a um, cl closed loop. So I'm going to start by using a battery as a power source here. And if you want, you can use a couple of batteries, as long as they're connected, like so. And then we have our wires and I can move them around. These little blue dots represent the electrons. Obviously, there's not in a straight line, but it'll help with some of the uh, concepts that we're going to see in a second here. Uh, let's use a light bulb. Now, I always talk about ins and outs with light bulbs, right? The electricity has to go in one side. Usually, that's the bottom of the light bulb, and out the other side, that's the metal side. And then, I'll throw a switch in here so we can talk about open and closed circuits. So now we've gone ahead and built our first circuit. Notice there's no electricity flowing because it doesn't have that complete loop property. We have a power supply, we have a load, but we don't have the complete loop. If I close this, ta-da, we get a complete circuit. So now, as far as power supplies are concerned, some of you may have said, well, what about the things that plug into my wall? Well, there's a difference between what's called AC, alternating current, and DC, which is direct current. An alternating current source does just that. When we saw the direct current flow, the electrons continued to move in one direction, in a circle. Now when we use an AC power supply, we can see that the electrons kind of wiggle back and forth. They alternate one direction and then the other. Well, now you might be asking, well, this light bulb seems to be flickering. Why don't I see that? That's a good question. Take a minute and think about that now. This process has been significantly slowed down for our visualization purposes. So what ends up happening is this is happening fast. It'll happen at 60 hertz. That means 60 times a second it'll go back and forth, which is about the rate where our eye can't detect the difference. So all of our outlets run at 120 volts and 60 hertz, unless you're in Europe. Um, there are also some, like washing machines, dryers, that'll run at 240 volts. And now that we're on the topic of voltage, let's talk a little bit about that. All right, voltage is one of those words that we've all heard, but very few of us understand what it actually is. Voltage in, I think, the simplest terms is how badly do the electrons want to go from one side to the other? So I have a simulation here that will help show that. Now, in this simulation we just have two little boxes, we'll call them cells. And I have my group of, I guess these little people, will pull the electrons from one side to the other. So right now my voltage is reading zero. So if I go ahead and I want to pull the battery so that I have more electrons on one side than the other, these are I'm charging my battery here. So 
Now, these electrons on the right really don't like each other. As you've probably learned already, electrons repel other, other electrons. So we have a very negative on the far right here, but we also have probably a positive on the left there. So if we were to connect a wire from one side to the other, from here across to there, the electrons would flow. This is current electricity. This is what creates the current. So how bad do the electrons want to get from one side to the other? Now, if we just go ahead and show the battery, this, we can see the bumpy side of the battery is always the positive side, in case you didn't know that. And then the other side is the negative side. So we have lots of electrons over here, and they want to go over to the other side. Now, going back to our original idea, going back to our original idea, all of these batteries, I have a triple A, double A, and a D. Which battery do you think has the most voltage? Before I answer that, I want you to go ahead and we're going to draw ourselves a little picture here. So I'm going to pause this. Here we have a crude drawing of the three batteries that I showed. And each battery is going to have a certain amount of electrons, right? This is the positive side that has the bump. So we know that most of the electrons are going to be on the negative side. So we'll draw some electrons down here. Same thing in this case. Same over here. Now, clearly, we can see that the D battery has a lot more electrons. But, I also want you to notice the amount of space that it has. Uh, for good measure, let's go ahead and just put in our positive side. So technically, this is a lack of electrons on the top side. So it would be something like this. We'll call those positives. And don't forget, there are positives in the bottom side. Just for illustration purposes, I only drew the negatives. Now, Coulomb's law says that the closer together electrons are, the more they want to be away from each other. So, while this one has a lot of electrons, there's also a lot of space. This one has less electrons and less space. This one has even less electrons, but it also has less space. So in essence, what we've done is we've kind of kept the amount of push from one side to the other the same. So I can go ahead and tell you that all three of these batteries now are all the same voltage, and they're about 1.5 volts. Pretty crazy, huh? Now, a 9-volt battery works a little bit differently. It's a smaller container containing more electrons on one side. So um, if we had taken this same size container, I'm going to leave you with this question. If we would taken the AAA size container and we had used the same amount of electrons, stuffed them all in there somehow or another, as the D battery, what do you think would happen to my voltage, my potential difference, my electric potential, the voltage? I know there's a lot of words for voltage. So if I have even more, I think you can come up with the answer. So that's the essence of voltage. That's one of the key concepts that you need is what is voltage. The next one is what is current. 
Well, current is just like what you would think, like with a hose, for example. So if I were to draw, all right, let's let this be our hose. And then this is my water or electrons, but we're going to just use water for right now. So we've got water flowing through the hose. That's a current. Now if we did the same thing and we go back to this picture and we connected a wire from one side oops. if we connected a wire from one side to the other these electrons want to get away from each other so what are they going to do they're going to go away from each other to the other side where's my mouse okay so the electrons then travel along the wire like this. So this is the direction of the electron flow. Now, for some reason, don't ask me why, I think it was because at the time they couldn't they knew there was a current flowing, but they couldn't tell which direction it was flowing. They just used the positive sides and they called the positive conventional current is defined by the flow from positive to negative. There's a better picture that I took from Wikipedia. I know it's not the best source, but I know that this happens to be correct. So here, we can see that, by the way, this little symbol right here is a battery. And the longer line is the positive side. So we see that the electrons are actually flowing out of the negative and going towards the positive, but we call the flow of positive charge our conventional current. So, One last point about current that I wanted to discuss is when we flip a light switch, we can see that the lights come on almost immediately. However, electrons really only flow pretty slowly, um, on the order of about a centimeter a second. It's called electron drift speed. So why is it that when I shut the switch, the electricity flows almost immediately? So I'm going to leave you with that question to ponder over and maybe talk with your peers uh, or your professors. Um, it has something to do with what my students like to call the domino effect. So, And I think this particular simulation does a good job of showing why. So that said, uh, let's go, on, go ahead and look at the factors that affect current. This is a representation of a wire. All those little black dots, while there be many, many more of them, uh, those represent the atoms. Now, as we know, an atom is composed of the subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons. Certain um, atoms will allow electrons to flow more easily from one side to the other because of their valence electrons which is a little beyond the scope of this gets a little into chemistry but basically metals are often very good givers of electrons they freely give off what's the electrons that are on their outer shell so if this was a metal we could think about the electricity flowing from one side to the other Ask yourself, what are some of the things that we can do to make it either easier or more difficult for the electricity to flow? Take a minute, pause it now, and try to come up with some ideas. Now, we don't need to know the, ex for my class, you don't need to know the exact equation or calculating resistance based on the geometry. But here's what I want you to know. If we make the wire longer, we have more stuff to get through.
uh, let's say for a second for argument's sake pretend this is a hose and you're trying to get water from one side or to the other right the longer the hose is the more difficult it is to get to the other side makes sense now if I have a very narrow hose notice how my resistance increases so if you said the length of the wire or the diameter this A is actually the uh, cross-cutting area um, so the diameter shrinks we get a big giant resistance very small large area small resistance and you can see how the variables are changing on the left there all right this Greek letter Rho represents um, a property for the material like I said a lot of metals easily give up their electrons but not everything gives up electrons equally right so if we have something that has wants to keep its electrons quite a bit there's a lot of stuff in the way we can visualize this as a hose with a lot of rocks in the middle right the more rocks we have in the middle the harder it is for it to get to the other side so if our material hangs on to the electrons tightly meaning it's an insulator our resistance goes up significantly the less stuff we have in the way the more freedom it we have for our electrons to flow through and we get a tiny resistance so with these three variables what could we do pause it now what could we do to maximize the resistance conversely what could we do to minimize the resistance I'll leave that up to you guys to play with the simulation I'll add links to these simulations in the comments below all right so that wraps up part one so you should be by this t time able to tell me what are the things that make up a circuit what is resistance what is voltage what is current and we're going to look at how those things are interrelated in the next video and we're going to do some mathematical analysis of circuits and break that down a little bit so without any of this you wouldn't have your cell phones you wouldn't have your iPads so these are things that we use every day and um, I hope you're as excited about circuits as I am. It's a lot of fun to build the circuits and hopefully in your class you get to do a lot more hands-on uh, building the circuits and uh, discovering some of the relationships in them. Thanks for watching. I'm Dan Pfeiffer and here is my information. I would love to hear uh, further questions that you have for me or ideas for future videos. Um, please send them to the email address listed there. Thanks again. Have a good day.